Welcome to Public Health On Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Our focus is the novel coronavirus. I'm Josh Sharfstein, a faculty member at Johns Hopkins and also a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal with this podcast is to bring evidence and experts to help you understand today's news about the novel coronavirus and what it means for tomorrow. If you have questions, you can email them to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, Dr. Colleen Berry, the chair of the Department of Health Policy and Management at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, talks with Dr. Elizabeth Stewart, an associate dean and public health statistician, and Dr. Carrie Altoff, an epidemiologist at Johns Hopkins. In addition to being faculty members, all three are parents of elementary school-aged children who are heading into a summer that has been upended by the COVID-19 pandemic. They discuss a framework for making parenting decisions through the summer months. Let's listen. Carrie and Liz, thank you so much for joining me today. The three of us share a couple of things in common. We're all faculty members at Johns Hopkins and also parents of younger children. My social networks are abuzz with questions about how families, especially those like ours with younger children in the home, are making decisions for the summer. Carrie, when it comes to families, summer camps and family vacations are so important. Should we cancel all of those plans? It is tough to make decisions. And so a decision-making framework can be very helpful when we're navigating those tough decisions. And I start with just a North Star for a decision-making framework. Mine is to protect myself, to protect my family, and to protect my community. Just reminds me that all my decisions should be in alignment with that guiding principle. And then the next thing I do is I kind of recall what my family's risk is. I need to know where my points of exposure are for both me and my entire family. And then when I think about interacting with others, I use a similar template to kind of assess what their risks might be. So I have a better understanding of what I'm undertaking when I make a decision to interact with others. So a decision-making framework sounds really helpful, but perhaps it's less concrete than just a list of do's and don'ts. Let me push here a little. Are there summer activities that are just simply off the table? How much of this is about our own values and circumstances, which might differ from family to family, versus absolutes that we all should be following to control the virus? So, you know, we're going to continue to learn more and more about the virus as time goes on. Science is working at a frantic pace right now. And for every expert that has an opinion on one specific scenario, you're bound to find another expert who has a slightly different opinion. So instead of do's and don'ts, this decision-making framework mindset can be really helpful to just calm your own anxieties and keep your family safe and healthy for the summer. So the decision-making framework is what I rely on. And then, of course, the best tools that I know we have right now to reduce the risk of transmission. Of course, those are physical distancing, mask wearing, and hand washing. Liz, summer means lots of outdoor time. Lots of people I know have questions about whether being outdoors is less risky than indoor space for virus transmission. What's the scoop here? Yeah, that is generally correct. You know, we're still learning a lot about this virus and how it transmits. As Carrie mentioned, science is proceeding at a very brisk pace. Um, we're, so we're still learning, but there really is increasing evidence that the risk of disease transmission outdoors is quite low, especially if you can maintain that physical distance. So physical distance is still a core part, um, but the idea is that the disease spreads even less when you're outdoors and there's air circulation and air flow than in closed physical spaces. So I think that's one way where we might be lucky sort of in the summer in that it's easier to have these outdoor activities. I think we can be more confident in sort of with a decision-making framework and sort of thinking about outdoor activities, you know, maybe small backyard barbecues, uncrowded beaches, maybe even potentially outdoor day camps for kids. Uh, I will say all of my kids' camps have been canceled, uh, but there was one that was gonna be 
outdoors, lots of hiking and sailing and swimming. I would have driven them to it, a relatively small group of kids. And my decision making might have been quite different for that day camp than for one that would have been a lot of indoor time with lots of different kids coming and going. So those are some of the sorts of factors that you can factor into the decision. So um, getting back to families, can my kids see their grandparents? It's been a long time, and I want them to be able to maintain that strong bond. Liz, what about grandparents? Yeah, this is such an um, important topic. Um, so important for kids to see their family members um, and for the older family members to see their grandchildren and other um, younger family members. So this, um, in terms of the decision-making framework, this gets to a question of sort of who is the potential interaction with. Um, and the challenge here is that older adults, such as grandparents, are at higher risk for poor outcomes um, of COVID-19. Um, but again, it's important for families to spend time together. So I think here, again, this gets back to thinking then about your own situation. Uh, it might depend, for example, on how many people you interact with regularly, for example, in your job, um, how able you are to physically distance from others. I know some families are even going to wear a mask while visiting their grandparents. So maybe they recognize that they do have sort of some concerns and want to maintain wearing a mask while they're visiting their grandparents. And so they at least still spend time together, but maintain some of those protections. Again, sort of just speaking uh, in my own situation, my family will be spending time with my mom this summer, uh, but we're going to do so in a way that I feel comfortable with within this sort of framework um, and being very careful to have high levels of physical distance, physical distancing before we go and also once we're there. So what about child care? Carrie, do you have recommendations for those of us with young children about how to have conversations with a child care provider who, about who they interact with? Of course. So child care is, is essential for a lot of working families, and especially as things start to open up and more and more parents are maybe asked to go back into the office or, or do other things that will need their undivided attention. So child care providers can either come into your home or there are some child care providers that are opening up across uh, the country. So if you're going to a child care provider, make sure you know all of their protocols and processes for how they're getting kids in. Um, we have a daughter that goes to the Johns Hopkins Affiliated Child Care Center. There are temperature screenings every day, not just for the little ones, but for the parents that are dropping them off. We have to wear masks. We can't even come within a certain footage of the front door so that teachers can open it safely and not come into close contact with us. We bring our own pens when we sign our kids in and out. So there are a lot of safety precautions that many of these child care facilities that are licensed to reopen are undertaking. And knowing what those processes are and not only being respectful of them, but being a team player for with those processes is really important. Now, other families are going to have child care providers come into their home. And I think this is something that everybody has to make their own decision on. But there are ways you can reduce your risk when you invite someone like a child care provider into your home to help you with the kids for the summer. So one thing that you'll have to be able to do is start this conversation with an individual who you would be considering bringing into your home. So asking them about what their social distancing and physical distancing practices are. If you are really committed to being, being safe in the home with mask wearing, uh, you'll have to express that clearly so that provider knows what the expectation is. And then of course, also with hand washing. So what's the expectation when someone comes in your home to hand wash, how many times a day, those types of things. And I'll tell you, it's not an easy conversation to have. I have also had to have someone come into my home to help me with my two older kids while I've had calls and my husband's seeing patients and it's a busy time. We do have open communication. And I also make sure that that person really understands our family's risk, but also my commitment to making sure that the people who are in my home are also practicing good physical distancing, hand washing and mask wearing. So it sounds like we're moving from essential interactions to maybe necessary interactions. How can I start helping my family reconnect with others, with um, friends and family uh, in safe ways? We've already talked about 
um, grandparents and childcare providers, but what about our, our somewhat broader networks? Liz? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, and I think, as you just said, we're sort of transitioning to think differently about what interactions are essential or necessary and starting to think about the possibility of having broader social uh, interactions. And for many people, that really is important. We to all, many of us have become very accustomed to this idea of staying what Carrie had termed hyper-local, um, sort of the household unit staying very tight. Um, but that's very tough on many people, especially teenagers. Um, and seeing friends might be particularly important for mental health. Um, that might be true for a lot of adults as well. So I think there we want to start thinking about doing that, but in sort of selective and careful ways. So still keeping this mindset of hyper-local and using some of the strategies we've already touched on, um, but basically staying in relatively small groups still, try to interact with people who have not themselves been interacting with large numbers of other people. Um, you know, do again, do those activities outside, bring your own food. I do want to enforce this idea that, or sort of reinforce this idea that one thing to think about are these chains of transmission. So you might think, oh, we're spending time with three other families this week. But if each of those families is also spending time with three or five other families, immediately those potential chains of transmission just get potentially quite large. So that's where sometimes these tough questions and tough conversations might happen to sort of get a sense for when you start interacting with a slightly larger set of people, how much is that really exposing you to uh, and sort of how, how much exposure are they kind of bringing to your environment. But again, I think it's really important to note that especially in summer, there's going to be opportunities to reach out in these ways and meet on a soccer field, bring a picnic blanket, and each family sits on the picnic blanket and sort of stays outdoors and kind of interacts, but in these maybe slightly different ways. You know, I've also seen the use of pool noodles for kids to help them understand distance because I have a four-year-old who ha has no concern about distance, right? She runs wild, and I love that. The pool noodle thing is something I've got to try because first of all, everybody loves a good pool noodle fight. But second of all, it really does keep the kids apart when you say, you know, you got to be about a pool noodle distance away from somebody. I've just found those visual cues are, are helpful as we're kind of helping our kids understand what this new normal is. That's great. I love that. What about these concepts of closed bubbles or quarantines? What are these, Liz, and should we be thinking about them? Yeah, we are all learning all sorts of new terms during this pandemic. Uh, so the idea here is, I've heard them sometimes called double bubbles or uh, quarantines. Um, but broadly, it sort of formalizes that idea that I was alluding to um, previously, essentially slightly broadening this hyper-local idea. So essentially saying instead of each household staying completely isolated, maybe two households kind of team up and form a quarantine. And those two households, you know, agree that they, their kids will go back and forth and maybe play at each other's houses, backyards, maybe indoors, but at least backyards. Maybe they um, team up for childcare and actually share, you know, mornings and afternoons or something to sort of help the parents uh, do the work that they need to do. Um, but the key is that these quarantines or double bubbles um, have an explicit conversation with each other um, about maintaining the distance, sort of the physical distance with others. So they sort of agree to say, well, we are going to interact with each other, but we're going to still not interact with people outside of our quarantine. We haven't done this ourselves, but I often think that the conversations leading up to this might feel quite a bit like dating and sort of some awkwardness of, hey, will you be willing to quarantine with us? Um, but I think it can be a really effective strategy, especially for families with children who are just going stir crazy and really want to reach out and play with friends. Um, and so they really might help families get through a summer uh, without camps or other sorts of childcare. So again, sort of maybe start to have some of those tough conversations and think about whether there are some options for this uh, within your network. One caution though that I do want to end on um, on this theme is one point to remember is that there are these benefits of the quarantine idea, um, but if one member of either of the families gets sick, then really that whole unit should quarantine themselves. So you are sort of entering in, into this broader group, taking both the benefits, but then also potential risks, where if one person does get sick, 
you're going to want to be really careful to isolate, uh, well, to quarantine sort of the entire, both families. Point well taken. But this concept really resonates for me with an only child. No child should be all alone with just their parents for this extended period of time. Um, so so I, I hear what you're saying. Let's change the topic a little bit. Um, and given that COVID transmission, as you've both noted, is so relevant at the local level, I think it's important for all of us to keep an up-to-date sense of what transmission looks like within our own community to help make all of these decisions that we're talking about. What is the information, carry um, that uh, families should be paying attention to in their local communities? So this is a great question. And this is kind of this final piece that we incorporate into our decision-making framework. And it requires our decision-making framework to be flexible because what is going on at your local level can change over time. Um, it could change week to week. It could change month to month. It, it's just it's going to change, that's, that's the bottom line. So we've had our North Star, we've assessed our family's risks and thought about others' risks. We've thought about who we would interact with, where we would interact. We've thought about all of these different aspects of the interaction and trying to keep um, our interactions limited to what's necessary, You know, just one step above maybe what's essential. So this last piece about what do we look at in our community when we're trying to understand what the risk of COVID is in our community? Well, first of all, you have to find trusted sources of information. And so I recommend local or state health department websites because that's gonna tell you what's going on in your community. There's also the GHU coronavirus map, which recently has now gone down to the county level within each state, which is super helpful because the county is of course a much smaller unit and probably feels more like your neighborhood than the state level. So when you go into those um, different websites, you're going to first look at the number of COVID-19 cases. So this number includes those who test positive. And remember that not everyone who is infected or feels sick will access a test if they do feel sick. So that number is the tip of the iceberg. There are also going to be people who don't feel sick, right? We call those asymptomatic individuals. So although this number is important, it's just the tip of the iceberg for actually who might be infected in your community. So what you want to look at is you want to see what that number of cases is doing over time. You want to note if it's going up or if it's going down. And the other thing you have to be aware of is if there is a major change in the amount of testing that's going on in your community. So if something happens where your state gets access to a bunch more tests or you open up another, another lab in your state and all of a sudden your state is doing more tests, you are going to see more cases because you're doing more tests. So you got to kind of let that play out a little bit, let a few days pass so you can see kind of how the trend may settle out after what will likely be an increase in the number of cases affiliated with an increase in testing. So the second number I think people should look at is the number of deaths in the community. And I know there's been a lot of debate about how to measure COVID-19 deaths, but you don't have to know every detail about that debate when you look at the number of deaths in your community, because again, you're going to be looking at that trend over time, right? Not just how many people died today, but over the last week, what does that look like? Is that number moving much? Hopefully it is decreasing, signaling lower risk. So as long as they're not changing, your, your, your website, your source of data is not changing how they are counting deaths over time, that trend will help guide you. Again, increasing, that means COVID is, is pretty active in your community, decreasing, those are, those are hopeful signs that, that it's more under control in your community. Finally, I think the thing to remember is that what, when you're looking at these numbers, any tiny little change from one day to the next is not what you wanna fixate on, right? So look at the whole week, look at what happened the week before, look where things have gone in the past month. That's really how we look at these data as epidemiologists. So we understand and get a better picture of what's going on. This is a live public health moment, right? Things are changing all the time. No data is perfect, but a lot of data can be really helpful. Number of cases and number of deaths and how those are changing over time for your community can help you assess whether or not there's an increasing risk or a decreasing risk of COVID in your community.
So this summer, we're just doing our best to make healthy decisions. That's what this conversation has been about. But what happens if someone in my household gets sick? And Liz alluded to this, but can you just very briefly give us the, the main principles, Carrie? Sure. So it's a hard stop. If somebody gets sick, everything changes. Your decision-making framework has to immediately go to one point, which is isolation of that sick person in your home as best you can and complete quarantine of your entire household. And you're going to stay like that for a while. And it's not just 14 days. Unfortunately, you're going to have to stay quarantined until the isolated person is well and can come off isolation from that last day that they're isolated, that's when your 14 days of quarantine start for everybody else. And that's because you're all exposed within your household from the time um, that that person is infected all the way through the time that they are done being ill and they're off isolation um, protocol. Now, where do you find those protocols? It's on the CDC website under caring for someone who is sick with COVID in your home. So they have really good advice on there. And I think you should go to it and read through it before anyone gets sick in your family, right? This is preparation. You got to know what, what to expect. Having different things lined up for how are we going to get groceries? Can somebody drop them off? Because you really want to take that quarantine very seriously because your family is high risk if you have someone who has become ill with COVID and they're in your home. Also on the CDC website is a risk calculator to help you monitor the individual who is sick to know when it's appropriate to take them to seek emergency care. It is advised that you do call your doctor and let your physician know if you believe you are sick with COVID, especially if you need help accessing a test. So the other thing you have to do is you have to pick up your phone because you may have a contact tracer calling you. There's been a lot of, of discussion and buzz about contact tracers, and there are a lot of people in our communities now whose job it is to identify those cases. And once they have a case identified, call them, talk to them about what they've been doing over the last few days and weeks, and put together the picture of the other individuals that they may have been in contact with. So they can help you call and put the word out so that other individuals you've been in contact with know that they might be exposed and should be quarantined. If you do not have someone sick in your home, you should still be answering your phone because Again, it could be a contact tracer with the unfortunate news that you have potentially been exposed to someone who is confirmed to have COVID-19. And if that's the case, then your 14-day quarantine process would start. So understanding what's going to happen if you get those calls is really important and getting yourself prepared for it is really important. That's great. So final question to you, Liz. This period has been really hard. My fourth, fourth grader has been in virtual school. He misses his friends, he misses his teachers. Summer's supposed to be fun, an opportunity for all of us, not just our kids, but adults too, to relax and take life down a notch. I need a little ray of hope here. What can we as parents do to bring as much joy and fun as possible to our summer? Oh, I wish I had a perfect answer to this question. Um, I think I would just encourage everyone to do as you just alluded to, Colleen, you know, sort of try to take it down a notch, lower expectations all around and try to find pockets of joy in, you know, whether it's walks around the neighborhood, trips to hopefully quiet, uh, you know, quiet and non-crowded beaches, jigsaw puzzles, uh, whatever it is. Um, it's, this is a stressful time. It has been, and I think it will continue to be a stressful time for many families. Um, so just try to find time for relaxation and fun, um, even if those activities might look a little bit different this year. But I think we can all uh, do what we can to still find that joy. Carrie and Liz, thank you both so much for joining me. Thank you for listening to Public Health on Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Please send questions to be covered in future podcasts to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. This podcast is produced by Josh Sharpstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Lamare Morales. Audio production by Niall Owen-McCusker and Spencer Greer, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening.